We're going to be looking at how to measure temperature using different devices. And the purpose of this specific video is to show you the different characteristics of different devices that are available to measure temperature and to show you that there isn't just one solution to a problem. It is different um, methods of, of measuring temperature and also in terms of um, different characteristics and advantages and disadvantages you've got to take into account. Okay, so the first um, system we're going to be looking at is the ideal gas thermometer. Um, and so just a few things about it that you need to be aware of is that the following gases are used depending on the temperature being measured. So if you want to measure a temperature range from minus 30 degrees Celsius to about 500 degrees Celsius, then you would use nitrogen as the gas. Um, if you want to lower that temperature to less than um, minus 30 degrees Celsius, then you would use helium for that. You also get vapor pressure thermometers. Um, so it's a thermometer in which a variable saturated vapor pressure of a volatile liquid is used as a measure of the temperature and which thus has an advantage over some other types of thermometers of being free from errors due to bulb expansion. And we will be, you'll be able to sort of see an example of one of these. It's probably one that you've seen or come across quite um, um, often. Um, you might see them, uh, these type of analog gauges that are being used to measure temperatures and stuff. And uses <coughs> alcohol, freon and water as a liquid. Okay, then you also get a liquid expansion or a liquid type expansion thermometer. So it works on the same principle as your vapor pressure thermometer, but consists of liquid. It's the same range as mercury and glass thermometer. Okay, so just be, be aware of those characteristics for your liquid type expansion thermometer. Right, then um, we're going to be looking at volume expansion thermometer. A liquid and glass thermometer. So it consists of a bulb and a thin tube through which a liquid can be seen. Sometimes it has a concentration chamber to prevent the indicator from from withdrawing into the bulb or a second bulb at the other end um, for overheating. So your mercury ranges from minus 20 degrees Celsius all the way up to 500 degrees Celsius. Um, and then the upper limit of the range may be raised by introducing either nitrogen or carbon dioxide into the volume above the mercury. So this raises the boiling point of the mercury and the alcohol thermometer is used for lower ranges. And you'll see a diagram of this typical bulb type of thermometer, bulb at the bottom and then um, you're able to, to see the liquid expanding as temperature increases and therefore you're able to know what temperature is. Very common similar type of ones um, as you would sort of see in, in these images as well is um, you, you might have come across them before they appear to be like uh, um, the ones that you get used to measure your temperature um, they could be the ones that um, you put underneath your tongue to measure your body temperature could also be very similar to the ones that you would often find um, um, outside in weather stations um, where they still use the analog systems or the mechanical systems and not the digital systems as such and so um, they are still commonly used to be able to measure certain readings. You'll see that there's three different configurations that you can have with these thermometers. The first one is a, a total immersion thermometer. Okay, So if you have a look at that you will see that where the level is that it rises up to, that is um, immersed by the liquid in the specific bowl. Then you get a partial immersion thermometer, so that would be where the aspect where the measure, or at least the indicator is of what the temperature is, that's not submerged in the actual liquid um, that it's measuring. And then finally you get a complete immersion thermometer, that's the entire thermometer com that's completely immersed in the bowl of liquid that you're wanting to measure. Okay, so then, um, then the other aspect we're going to be looking at, this is now more of a, a, um, a scenario that you could also incorporate into more of electronic type of um, environment, 
It's a bimetallic um, strip. So um, metals have got different coefficient of expansion. So in other words, depending on um, if you apply a certain amount of um, heat or change in temperature to two specific um, metals or, of, or two different types of metals, the one would ex expand differently compared to the um, other one. So what you do is, is you would bond these two metals together and, um, and that would be at a specific temperature um, T0. And so it will appear flat. But as temperature increases, the one metal will tend to start bending um, and that would cause that this, there will be sort of a, a circular f um, shape forming with the two metals. So essentially what you do is, is you measure what this radius is and depending on what that radius is, you'll be able to then determine what the temperature is. So um, there's some, um, um, will be either equation that would be related to that or some graph that you could get this data from to be able to correlate what the temperature is depending on what that radius is. Now that we've had a look at some um, different types of thermometers or um, devices that can measure temperature, let's have a look at some electrical devices um, specifically for, for, temp for measuring the temperature. So um, the first one we're going to be looking at is a resistance thermometer. Um, so it is a device that varies its resistance as temperature changes. And for this resistance thermometer, there's the equation of the resistance equal to the resistance at um, zero degrees Celsius, and open brackets, one plus alpha um, multiplied by the temperature, plus beta multiplied by the temperature squared. Okay, so alpha and beta has got to do with the coefficient of frictions. Um, alpha is a linear coefficient of friction. Beta is the um, two-dimensional um, area um, or the area of coefficient of temperature. And um, so it would be um, zero for very small um, values of, of the temperature. The advantages that there are is that there's no reference junction needed and you'll see with, with or at least why this is important and where it get, gets used such as a, a reference junction. There's no special wires that are, or, or special extension wires that are needed. You'll see other examples very soon where that is a factor that we need to take into account. And they're usually made of platinum. That's if you want to measure um, temperatures of about 550 degrees Celsius. Copper for temperature of 120 degrees Celsius and nickel for temperatures of 320 degrees Celsius. Then we've got th thermistors, and um, they have a high negative coefficient of resistance. You'll actually see that um, the temperature over there is inverted in this exponential um, equation. So resistance equal to resistance at zero degrees Celsius multiplied by e to the power of beta multiplied by one over t minus one over the temperature at zero. Okay, the advantages of these th thermistors is that um, they're very sensitive. Now, response in order of milliseconds. They are very stable, and they've got a range of approximately zero degrees Celsius up to 320 degrees Celsius. Now, so now that we have had a look at these um, specific devices that give us different resistances, how does it sort of apply to our um, type of measuring devices? How do we implement it? Okay, so. There's something that's known as a Wheatstone Bridge. Okay, so a Wheatstone Bridge has got the following um, configuration. So you're going to have some or other positive voltage that will come down. You've got essentially what looks like a a bridge in terms of resistors and it appear in this fashion and then we've got our variable resistance over here which is our sensor that we're essentially having okay, so this point over here will come down to ground and then these two outputs over here will then go into an op amp comparator and that will give us an output to an A to D um, converter or analog to digital converter of a microcontroller. 
Okay, so this could be R1, R2, and R3. Okay, and um, this could be R4, um, just for sake of, of labeling different things. So the thing is, though, is, okay, this is an R3, just do not confuse it as a, as a B. And so um, it is an equation relating all these resistance values and the voltage that you're getting out and stuff. And I'm not going to focus on that. That's not the, the purpose. I just want you to know that there is something that's a Wheatstone bridge. This is a basic configuration. It is any connected to an analog to digital converter of a microcontroller. So a microcontroller essentially has different values that it can give you. Okay? And um, the analog to digital converter um, is able to supply with values that are ranging from zero and that is going all the way up to a range of 1024. 1024, keep in mind, that is equal to 2 to the power of 10. Okay, so we've got this range of numbers that this microcontroller can read from 0 to 1024. Essentially, that correlates with um, values going from 0 volts all the way up to 5 volts. That's if your microcontroller is operating in a um, 5 volt um, environment. You do get some microcontrollers that do operate on 3.3 volts, for example, so, but generally we assume it to be 5 volts. Okay, so let's say, for example, I get a value of uh, um, from the analog to digital converter, which is equal to, um, oh, let's make it 352. So that's the number I'm, I'm, I'm obtaining from the analog to digital converter, or at least what the microcontroller is reading. So essentially what I'll do is I'll divide it by 1024 to get that ratio that it is over here. So that 352 might appear around about over here on a specific scale. Okay, so that would be 352. So what voltage will that correlate to? Okay, so once we've got that ratio, we multiply it by 5 and we equal to 352 divided by 1024 multiplied by 5 and that's equal to 1.71875 volts okay now once we've got this voltage we can in circle well if we get this voltage how would it correlate in terms of what this resistance is of this variable um, resistance that we we've got all this sensor that we've got and then if you look at the data sheet of that specific sensor we'll be able to then correlate that in terms of knowing what the temperature is um, using those different equations we just had to look at okay the next thing we're going to be looking at is thermal couplers or thermal couples okay so it only works for people that are together um, that's what the couple actually refers to. It's not for a single type of person. So thermocouples work on a very similar basis, um, but there's first a few, few terms you need to be aware of. So you get a Seebeck effect. The Seebeck effect is when two dissimilar metals are joined together, an electromotive force or a voltage exists um, between them, which is a function of temperature. And so this would be a typical example. You've got metal A and metal B, they join together, and there's some voltage that comes out over them. The power effect, if current is drawn, then the EMF alters slightly. You might have come across this before where, for example, you're measuring the voltage of a battery, and as you apply a globe onto it and it starts shining as you continue measuring that voltage you'll actually realize the voltage might drop slightly because there's some current being drawn and then we've got the Thomson effect so if a temperature gradient exists along a wire then the electromotive force um, changes okay so the properties of your Thomson effect is that there has to be at least two junctions or two EMFs okay and it's necessary to calibrate one of these. In other words, you need a reference point. Okay, so if you have a look at these diagrams, you'll see two different configurations that can be used for this. Um, and for this um, thermocouples, you will see that um, in a first um, configuration, you've got um, constantin, which is over there. You've got ionates over there. They join together to measure the temperature T. 
this iron piece comes into the ice water mixture that um, constantin material comes down also gets joined into the ice water and then you've got copper wires joined over there in the ice water mixture that goes out to measure your voltage um, for your device okay so this is this is where you would measure the voltage using a multimeter or analog to digital converter um, the other configuration is where you've got the one wire that's constant in, goes to up to the point where it measures the temperature you've got then iron linked up to that coming down into your ice water mixture which is joined to another wire of constant in, going to where you're going to measure the um, voltage for the specific device and so in this um, specific instance like with the previous ones where there were advantages that you didn't have to have a ice water mixture, you didn't have to have certain materials that are connected in terms of wires and stuff. This type of configuration does have those type of properties that you need to take into account. So you actually need an ice water mixture over here um, for zero degrees Celsius um, in both of these type of scenarios. So it's either or type of scenario that you can have to, or different configurations of the setup to be able to get the same um, output of results.